my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This week, the long arm of austerity and how it's impacted key areas of the welfare state, including the NHS. Throughout the pandemic, ministers from Boris Johnson down have said the aim of the government's COVID strategy was to prevent the health service being overwhelmed. But according to the British Medical Association, waiting lists for treatments have now reached a record high. Coronavirus is, of course, the immediate cause, but underlying it is a system that was already creaking because after the arrival of David Cameron's coalition government in 2010, spending failed to keep pace with demand, causing harm to patients. We'd done amazing things in the two decades previously in terms of preventing avoidable illness, including things like cancer and heart disease, really serious diagnoses through social interventions and public health interventions. And our ability to do that during austerity just tails off entirely and, in fact, begins to go down. So our progress really stalls. We'll also be hearing about the impact of austerity on children's services too. I think we need to really wake up to this lack in funding, the gaps in support that mean children are falling through the net because we're cutting off a generation's future and that's really, really concerning. All that to come. First, just a reminder that the Byline Times doesn't have wealthy backers or hedge funds behind it. We rely on income from people like you taking out subscriptions to our brilliant monthly paper, The Byline Times. Your subs also help fund Byline TV and our fantastic news-breaking website, which is where you'll find details of how to subscribe. Just go to bylinetimes.com. That's bylinetimes.com. And if you have already subscribed, thank you. Now, when the coronavirus first hit in early 2019, the NHS was already struggling to keep up with existing demands on its services. The policy of austerity introduced by the coalition government in 2010 starved the public sector of cash and the health service was no exception. To understand how that impacted on what happened next, I've been talking to Chris Thomas, who leads on health and care at the IPPR, a progressive think tank. First, what exactly was austerity? Austerity was a programme that really started as a reaction in lots of European countries to the financial crash in the late part of the last decade. So what we saw was governments argue, including the coalition government as it was elected in in Britain, that the right response to the crash was to constrain public spending and in many cases to lessen it. And there were a few reasons for that. One is that the standard political argument of the right is often that big public spending, big state, isn't something to be desired. But there was a more direct argument as well. And we saw people remember at the time places like Greece struggling with levels of public spending, particularly given the negotiations with the Eurozone and Germany. The argument in the UK at the time used by Cameron and his government was that if people didn't trust Britain to pay their obligations, if they didn't see that we were managing our finances in the way that someone might manage a household budget, then we might be less likely to get loans, we might get higher interest rates, and in turn, our financial position would worsen. So that was kind of the logic of austerity. What we've actually seen is that countries that chose austerity, so that saw state spending really restrained from the last decade, haven't really had any advantage in terms of core economic metrics. So things like GDP haven't gone up faster in places like the UK, where we chose quite brutal measures, really, in terms of constraining social security spending, health spending faced a record deceleration, social care was cut, all these kinds of consequences of low public investment. But we have seen some other really worrying things. So we've seen, for example, productivity flatline. So hysteresis has been a big problem for the UK economy and obviously widening inequality. And then you get to something like COVID-19 and you see the UK stay in a fairly threadbare position trying to contend with the consequences of the pandemic. You can contrast that to some other countries. So a really nice example here is Iceland. Now, Iceland took a very different choice at the end of the financial crisis in the 2000s. And they went for a high investment and particularly a health investment approach. So they put money back into their public sector to try to stimulate growth, to try to make sure that there was a safety net for people that were facing potentially quite big economic difficulties. 
and they didn't face economic consequences, but they also saw some really positive things. So the suicide rate in Iceland, whereas ours increased quite sharply, the Iceland suicide rate declined quite sharply. So a whole range of really positive social measures in places like that. And what that teaches us is that we didn't have to do the decade of austerity in the way that we did. That was an economic response, but only one of several politically possible economic responses. Organisations like the OECD, the International Monetary Fund, those that in the last decade were big proponents of austerity have now come out and said, in the face of a new economic crisis caused by COVID-19, that actually austerity wouldn't be the right response. So what we're seeing is, is now in this decade, austerity starting to be discredited, which is a really interesting and fast transition from that previous status quo. And again, indicates that austerity was a political choice, not a kind of objective one. And by taking money out of the economy through austerity, you can argue that contributed to the credit crunch which followed the financial crash. It became harder for large institutions and then for individuals on whom they relied for income to spend money. It made the gears of the economy grind ever more slowly. I totally agree. And we only have to look at some of the best responses to what we're seeing now, this very current COVID-19 induced economic crisis. The best responses have been those that have been built around high levels of stimulus. So you can look at Joe Biden in the United States has put in place a multi-trillion dollar investment package that covers things ranging from, you know, uh, health to social care. And and, and actually social care has been a key pinnacle of, of his stimulus, but also some kind of climate initiatives as well. Or you can look at Japan that have gone even further than President Biden in terms of the amount of state stimulus that they're putting into public services and into the economy. And the reason this is good is that it stimulates growth. And that's one of the things that we really need if we're thinking about how can we make sure public finance is sustainable. Well, actually, a a growth-led recovery is a really good way to do that in terms of making sure that we can feel comfortable with debt-to-GDP ratios, those kinds of things. We we saw actually during austerity that the key economic measures that the government were using and come back to kind of levels of debt and debt-to-GDP ratios that didn't actually get any better during that decade and you know, we come to the end of the decade we face a second once in a lifetime economic and, and social crisis so i think you're absolutely right the the real answer here is to make sure that the economy keeps growing and to do that through public investment is a good decision because we know that that works we can see internationally that that works specifically with regard to the nhs how was it impacted by austerity Yeah, the NHS is a really interesting case study of austerity. So what we see is actually that the National Health Service is one of the only government departments or areas of public spend not to experience a real terms cut, but instead it experiences a record deceleration in funding. So roughly the average increase in spend during the NHS's history per year is is somewhere between 3 and 4% real terms percentage point increase in its budget year on year. That increased quite a lot more sharply during what we might call the new Labour years and particularly those first Tony Blair premierships and then a massive cliff edge during austerity so it went up at just one percentage point real terms each year. The problem for the NHS is that it's contending with some huge problems even if we ignore COVID and we take COVID out the equation the aging population and the growing population mean that the demand pressures on the NHS are worth around three percent growth in budget each year that's what you'd need just to keep stasis in the National Health Service. So if you're going up below demand pressures each year in terms of funding, what you're actually doing is constraining the NHS's ability. And we could see that in some of the big efficiency targets that were being levied on the NHS. So in the first instance, there was the Nicholson Challenge, as it was called in the sector, which was a target by the coalition government for the NHS to find £20 billion worth of efficiency savings. So somewhere between a fifth and a sixth of its budget identified as efficiencies and cut. And that was how it was meant to keep going. It was meant to be put under financial pressures and to find efficiency savings that would keep it going. The problem is, is that one, that doesn't work as a tactic because the idea that a very stretched system can identify the right efficiency savings rather than cutting off very important services is a little bit false. But also the idea that the NHS has loads of inefficiencies is maybe a little bit wedded to the idea that, you know, public sector inefficient, private sector very efficient as a kind of false binary that's often put forward. 
And so you get to this point in 2017, 2018, that the NHS is genuinely very near collapse, where once we didn't really always even experience winter crises, that become default, the idea that the NHS would just really struggle during winter. And in fact, if you look to the activity data in 2017 across general practice, across acute, across hospitals, accident and emergency departments, in all cases, we were starting to see something that was being called an eternal winter. So 24-7, 12 months a year, the NHS under what would traditionally be considered winter crisis levels of pressure. If we look at the international comparisons, we see just how strained and stretched the NHS was. So we had less doctors than comparable countries, less nurses, less hospital beds, higher levels of occupancy. Our hospitals were almost uniformly unsafe in terms of the amount of patients they were caring for, less beds, less innovation, less technology. Really, it is, if you go across UK versus comparable countries, a kind of awful list of just under-resourcing and in turn, poor outcomes, things like cancer outcomes, stagnating, declining. So that's the picture that we get to at the end of 2019. Of course, at that point, unaware that we have COVID-19 and a massive public health shock looming on the horizon. But this is really the heart of this issue, isn't it? That throughout the years of austerity, well, other parts of the economy were experiencing real term cuts in their budget. The NHS was given overall above inflation rises, rises in real terms in their budget. But those rises were too small. They were too small to be consistent with the need of the NHS. And they were not rises that were consistent with the level of increase over the history of the NHS. So they were generous compared to what the rest of the economy was experiencing, but they fell way below what the NHS in practice was demanding simply to carry on doing its job. Yeah, exactly. And that essentially means that the NHS was was shrunk in terms of its ability to offer world-class care. I mean, it, I often look back at the founding principles of the NHS, and one that's really often forgotten is, you know, Nye Bevan stood up several times in front of the, the House of Commons, and he said, the NHS's point, the whole purpose of it is to universalise the best care. So to make sure it's not it's not a safety net in the way that sometimes we conceive welfare services, it's a tool by which we can collectively ensure that everyone has access to, to genuinely the best health care and that the cost of that is shared across the population. And the ability of the NHS to do that was fundamentally constrained during the austerity decade because it had to sacrifice much of that best practice against the kind of cost pressures it was coming under. The other really important point here is that the NHS is really, really sensitive to cuts that happen elsewhere within the state. So recently, the Institute of Public Policy Research did some analysis with the actuarial company Lane Clark Peacock. And our big search was for the things that we could identify that aren't NHS services, but that have the biggest impact on people's health. And the things that come up are education, skills, income inequality, child poverty, social security, universal credit. And all of those are things, if you look at the education cuts, the further education cuts, adult training budgets, those are all things that were cut, but that we know by being cut have a direct impact on people's health over the course of their lifetime. So if you're thinking about the NHS getting a small but insufficient rise, but actually other things that are really important, what we might call health vital departments being cut, you're just saving up lots of really long-term health problems. And of course, 10 years on, what we see is that if you strip away the pandemic again, the ability of the UK to prevent illness, we've done amazing things in the two decades previously in terms of preventing avoidable illness, including things like cancer and heart disease, really serious diagnoses through social interventions and public health interventions. And our ability to do that during austerity just tails off entirely and in fact begins to go down. So our progress really stalls. And that's basically a tangible quantification of us by not doing the things that are really important upstream to prevent ill health, us saving up problems for the NHS to contend with later. And there's a really awful endpoint to this, isn't there, which is that if we keep cutting really important social security and welfare state services from education to universal credit, and putting money into our very acute department, the NHS, we're only ever going to struggle because we're only ever heaping more and more pressure with our short-sightedness onto the National Health Service, onto hospitals, onto 
things that are meant to intervene at the last possible moment, not at the first possible moment when the best improvement is really possible. And concomitant with the cuts elsewhere in the economy, in particular local authorities who were responsible for delivering a lot of social care had their budgets in some areas quite savagely cut, didn't they? And certainly working as a journalist in the West Midlands, I was familiar with stories about, for example, daycare centres closing and people launching demonstrations against the council, then local councillors saying, well, don't look at us. It's the government. It was the councils who bore the brunt of protest, but it was the funding from central government that was causing the problem ultimately. But those apparently minor cuts in things like daycare centres ultimately then filter through to demand on the NHS, both in terms of physical health and in terms of mental well-being. Yeah, that's a brilliant example, isn't it, of the NHS being really sensitive to cuts elsewhere in the state local authority cuts mean that, yes, we say two things. One is that we have one of the most acute led models of care in the whole of the world. And what I mean by that is that we do very little to maintain people's independence at the point that a relatively small intervention might be what they need and what works. So, so the example of their daycare centres is, is a good one. And we do most of our care in two places. One, hospitals. So we let people get to hospital before we intervene, and that puts pressure on the NHS. And the other one is care homes, often not very nice, very institutional care. Other parts of the world do a lot more care in the community. They've really invested in social care and local authorities' ability to go into people's homes and provide them the support as early as they need it to make sure that actually that deterioration to the point that you might need very specialist, significant 24-hour hospital care is delayed for as long as possible. And that's a really cost-effective thing to do. So that's kind of part of that dynamic, isn't it, that you see the, the pressure mounting on the NHS because 10 years ago we made the decision that actually we weren't going to invest in social care could have taken lots of that pressure off and given people better lives. And that's that's an important part of it as well. It's not just the public finances. The other part is quite COVID relevant because the problem of having a very stretched strain social care system under local authority control versus an NHS that maybe has a little bit more fiscal headroom is that it was very hard to get things like discharge right. So people coming into the NHS and staying too long is a big problem, longer than they need to. And then people being released inappropriately, so being released too early is a big problem. And in both cases, again, that's not very good for the people that it impacts, but it's also not very good for the efficiency of public services. And it's a consequence of the strain they're under. That just means that either people are in the most expensive bit of the care system, the hospital, for longer and that costs money, or at least so early that they just have to come back. And again, that costs money. So that's a really good example, essentially, of if you put public services under unnecessary and artificial cost pressures in the hope that they search for efficiencies, Actually, often the result is inefficiency because they don't have the capacity, the headspace, the time to get some of those really important processes right. And that wasn't foreseen when austerity was begun as a regime, really. So I take from this then, Chris, that prior to COVID, the NHS was just about getting by. It was already creaking and it was creaking because government had not put enough money into it. And despite now the government saying that the purpose of its strategy around COVID is to prevent the NHS becoming overwhelmed, in reality, in most people's language, the NHS has already become overwhelmed. The fact that just under 6 million people now are on waiting lists, in most people's terms, that is evidence of an an NHS that has been overwhelmed. Yeah, and the news yesterday that there wouldn't be elective activity in the NHS now until 2022. So we face the rest of the year with the NHS because of the things that it has to do around COVID and the booster programme, which, you know, no argument from me that boosters are, are really important. But the consequence of that increase in activity has been that there won't now be elective activity. And for those listening that don't quite have a clear sense of what's being cancelled. That includes some really quite important things, your kind of classic 
knee operations, hip operations, but also routine surgeries and some treatments for some more serious conditions as well. So there are some really important things that are now just not available on the NHS. And that starts to contend with the idea that it remains a universal healthcare service. Your point that there are hundreds of thousands waiting over a year, I'm always amazed by just the total number of us in a queue at any given time at the moment for NHS services, which is just a whisker short now of 6 million people, over one in 10 of us, which is just a startling number to literally be in a queue for healthcare services and not receiving them for many of us as quickly as we absolutely need. So there's a very clear case, isn't there, that the NHS is under huge pressure and The even more important point is that that didn't have to be the case. COVID-19 has obviously been disrupted and there was no way that something as severe as a pandemic wasn't going to cause any disruption at all. But the amount of capacity that we had, the number of beds, the number of acute beds, the resilience, burnout levels and size of the health and care workforce, whether we had a really good discharge program between health and social care, and we know that lots of COVID positive patients did get discharged into into social care at the start of the pandemic. Those were all political choices that can't be detached from austerity that see us now in this position where every time we want to increase capacity because a new variant strikes and to take that capacity, go and do some COVID related stuff, the political choice has to be to cut essential NHS services elsewhere So we're caught in that bind, but that's not just because of the pandemic, that's because of the 10 years that preceded it. And we always comfort ourselves, don't we, with the thought that when the chips are really down, when we really need the NHS, it will be there for us. But I've been looking at figures from the BMA, the British Medical Association, for how quickly patients with cancer get their first treatments. Now, back in August 2019, 78.7% of patients got their first cancer treatment within two months of an urgent GP referral. By October 2021, that figure had fallen to just 67.8%. So in layman's terms, that means that one in three patients urgently referred for having cancer were having to wait more than two months for their treatment to start. I find that really, really scary. I think it's a shocking figure and and an alarming one for for many that that will hear it. Because you're right, we we love the, you know, the the British public love the NHS. That comes across in every opinion poll, across every political party. There is huge political will for and public will for the NHS to be something that's very extensive, very comprehensive. And the reason for that is that we all want the security that if something goes drastically wrong. And we know that in all of our lifetimes, it is almost certain that we will face some kind of health difficulty at some point. We we want the safety net of having fast access to the care that we need, that care being really good quality, and that principle of it being shared as a collective cost throughout our lifetime rather than a sudden catastrophic cost when we get there. Those are all really popular things. And that's what's at stake here, really. And when we look at statistics like the ones that you've just shared on cancer, I mean, our own research at PR suggests that essentially what happened was that we saw during the austerity decade a really consistent decline or at best a stagnation in care outcomes. And we can trace that across mental health services, across cancer services, across cardiovascular, all the biggies. And what COVID-19 then does, it really accelerates that decline. So takes us forward in terms of the trajectory of that decline, maybe 5, 10, 20 years, depending on the area. So now we find ourselves at a position that we really do risk the UK just not having anything like the access that either we've managed to offer people historically or that other countries prove as possible because we know that other European countries, the Scandinavian countries, but also Australia, New Zealand, their health systems comparably, and if we take cancer in particular, offer that better care, their proof that better is possible. And what really worries me about that, Adrian, is that we'll see people start to opt out of universal public health care. We'll see people begin to realise that actually if they have the means to and the willingness to, that they can supplement their care with maybe direct payments for care directly through private provider, through private insurance products, through might even be just £100 to skip the queue at, at a GP practice and get a same-day appointment. Those kinds of things are becoming more 
prevalent. And the really alarming thing there is that it leaves people without the ability or the willingness to do that, which would be an awful lot of people, with a substandard level of care. We've seen it happen in dentistry. We saw it happen in dentistry in the 90s. We know that it's the case in social care, which is an awful two-tier system. So these things can happen. And it would be a really awful legacy of COVID-19 if the new normal that we've all been talking about is one that the NHS is considered sustainable at a level it can barely really survive. And the only way to get the best care, as really is the case in the education system, is to pay significantly more. So I'm quite nervous about the precipice we stand on. And I think the statistic you've shared really epitomises why it's such a worrying place that we find ourselves. Chris Thomas from the IPPR and Chris's book, The Five Health Frontiers, A New Radical Blueprint, is available from January 2022 at Pluto Press. The recent tragic death of six-year-old Arthur Labinio Hughes at the hands of his father and stepmother has focused attention on another aspect of the welfare state, children's services, which are run by local authorities and which have also faced savage funding cuts since 2010. Spending on children's services in England alone was reduced by 24% in real terms in the first five years of austerity. This against a backdrop of growing numbers of youngsters being taken into care. Sean Norris has been writing for Byline Times about how austerity has impacted this vitally important but often neglected area. So I decided to investigate the cuts to children's social services and how that links to cuts to local authorities in the wake of the Arthur Lavigno Hughes tragedy. Now, it's worth saying before anything else that incidents like this, horrific killings like this, are solely the responsibility of the killers. You know, there's absolutely no way of diminishing or minimising their responsibility. However, I do think it's worthwhile looking at the impact of austerity on children's social services so that we can understand how to avoid these kind of tragedies by making sure services are funded properly in order to have interventions that keep children safe. So what I learned in my research was that there's been around a 60% cut to local authority funding from central government since austerity measures were introduced in 2010. I mean, that is a huge amount of money. And children's services are something that local authorities have a legal duty to provide. So in the wake of those cuts, local authorities were urged by the government to make up the shortfall through things like council tax and business rates. Now, that's completely fine if you're in a very, very rich borough like Kensington and Chelsea, where you can charge high council tax because people are living in multi-million pound houses. But more deprived areas found it much more difficult to make up this shortfall in funding because their rates and revenues from council tax and business were lower. And of course, in more deprived areas, you tend to have more of these social problems, which result in children needing more social support and services. That's not to say that child abuse and neglect does not happen in wealthy areas. But in terms of issues around deprivation and health, there are these kind of areas where we see more looked after children than elsewhere. And I think what this really highlights is, number one, there's a real lack of care about children's social services and the need to support vulnerable children in our society. So I think there's something really concerning that my research highlighted. Number one, we've seen this 46% cut to early intervention services, according to Research from Action for Children, which equates to £2.2 billion. And what this speaks to is a real lack of investment from government in children's safety and in children's futures. And this speaks to a much wider issue that we have around support for children in general, which we could see from, you know, the kind of paltry amounts given to COVID catch up funds of education to a wider sort of demonisation of young people and children, seeing them as bad, seeing them as trouble, the kind of hoodies, like nastiness that we see around how children are talked about. And I think we need to really wake up to this, A, the demonisation of young people, but also lack in funding, the gaps in support that mean children are falling through the net because we're cutting off a generation's future and that's really, really concerning. But the 46% cut in available funding for intervention services, for early intervention, is really troubling, isn't it? Because early intervention is the stage where social workers can go in, 
nip problems in the bud, help parents who might be struggling, who might not have the skills that they need to be good parents, can address issues early on and hopefully head off tragedies like that of Arthur Labinio Hughes. Absolutely. We've seen this swinging cut to early intervention services. And as you say, this is the time when social workers, teachers, police can identify problems, be them health, be it safety, be parents who don't necessarily have to. I mean, we're not born knowing how to be parents. We don't know when we have children. It's not like they come with a manual. You know, you need support. You need people to be around you, helping you and answering those questions. And of course, in more extreme spaces, you need to have that identification that there is a problem in order to intervene and stop a tragedy from happening. Now, in the wake of the Arthur Labino Hughes killing, there's been a lot of finger pointing. You know, police should have taken action, teachers should have taken action, social workers should have taken action. And all of this is true. There should have been an intervention, there should have been opportunities to spot where things were going wrong. But we also have to take that bigger view and look at where the budgets are, where the cuts are happening where we've seen rise in deprivation, rise in mental health issues, rise in problems around children's safety, and look at the cuts to the services and look at the cuts to local government and ask ourselves, where does this start and what can we do to fill these gaps? I mean, one of the big issues in early intervention, and which has had a lot of publicity, are the cuts and closures of Sure Start services. Now, the government has announced a plan to bring in something called family hubs, and this is really welcome, this is really positive. But it's so often the case with the impact of austerity What we lost through austerity is not fully being met with these new solutions. So there are still going to be gaps. And again, I'd really emphasize we need to think about how we are as a society when we are willing to let children, really vulnerable children, fall through these gaps, when we're willing to sacrifice the safety of children on the altar of austerity. And of course, we've been told now that austerity is over. We've been told that austerity is over. Theresa May said it, Johnson said it, obviously the spending taps have been turned on over COVID. And maybe there's been a decision not to make any more cuts, for example. But austerity doesn't just end with an announcement. This is a 10-year legacy of cuts to services, a 10-year legacy of underspending. And it was ideologically driven because of conservative coalition response that we had to live within our means and this sort of household metaphor that doesn't actually work for government. You know, just saying it's over doesn't mean you can reverse the pain and the suffering and the harm done by this decade long policy. And there has been one area of children's services where there has been a significant increase in spending. And this is the area of what's known as looked after children. Yes, yeah, so currently there's over 80,000 looked after children in England, and that includes children who have been adopted, but it also includes children who are in residential children's homes and in foster care. Now, one of the big changes in residential and foster care over the recent years has been a move of private providers coming into the sector and running homes and running foster care agencies. Now, again, it's really important to state that just because a private provider is running a home does not mean that the staff are not any less caring, any less dedicated, any less determined to protect children's safety than in a publicly run one. The people who work in these centres are incredibly important and we should value them. What is more troubling is that the increase of private provision means that there is a second entity, as it were, that these providers are serving, and that is their shareholders. They are in there to make profit as well as to provide care. And one of the most disturbing things I think I found doing research on children's social care was this brochure that was put together by a private investor's sort of advisory firm recommending that investors get involved in the private provision of children's social care where they talked about it as favourable demographics. And when you unpack what that means, they're talking about children who may have experienced neglect, may have experienced abuse, may have experienced horrific poverty, that means they can no longer be looked after by their parents, as a favourable demographic. Now, I don't see the social crisis created by children's social care and austerity as a favourable demographic. I see it as a crisis that we need to be resolving. I think there is growing concern at the increase of private provision in this sector, both because of the need to deliver to the shareholders, but also because private providers can change the prices of their services because they know there's such a real need and because it can create some instability in the sector. You know, we've had incidents where private providers have suddenly closed down centres, which of course then has a huge impact on the children living in them because they have to be moved again. And I think if anything, we can all agree that children who are looked after, who are in residential care, need stability over anything else. 
And so, again, we need to think about the impact of private provision in these spaces while also respecting the staff, you know, the brilliant carers who go to work every day because they care about children. Sean Norris, the Byline Times Chief European and Social Affairs Correspondent. You can read more from Sean and find out how to subscribe to the monthly Byline Times newspaper at bylinetimes.com. Your subscriptions pay for this podcast too, so go on, head over to bylinetimes.com. Cheers. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been the Byline Times podcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.